Well, I want to thank Dean uh, Sarah for the beautiful duet on the piano today for the offering. And I also want to say just a word about Dee. Um, many of you know Dee has served in our traditional worship uh, ministries for nine years now. And some of you may even know that she has a tra- transition coming up because she and her husband Scott are moving to Nashville very soon. So this is actually technically her last week here in our staff at Chapel Street Church. Uh, we are sad that Dee is moving. We tried to get her to commute every weekend uh, from Nashville. It's a little bit hard. But she served us for nine years. She leaves our traditional worship staff in great hands with Sarah and Dottie and Terry. But I wonder if you'd Join me in thanking Dee for her years of serving us here in traditional worship. Thank you, Dee. Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Thank you. Now, if everybody could line up single file and give her a hug before we... But I do want to personally thank you, Dee, for all the years working together. You know, worship is one of those things that, that happens every seven days in a church. There's never a weekend off. It happens every seven days. It has to be planned, rehearsed, prepared, and Dee has been faithful, absolutely trustworthy in doing that for us here in traditional worship, and we will always appreciate that. So good luck in Nashville. Well, we all know there are two seasons in Illinois at this time of year. I'm not counting spring. Spring doesn't count. Spring is not a season in Illinois. It's sort of an imaginary concept, (laughs) kind of like a unicorn. Uh, But the two seasons are, first of all, tax season, right? Ends on March 15th when we all dutifully file all the mind-numbing forms required by Uncle Sam. That's tax season. But now it's refund season, right? Everybody waiting for their refunds. For years, I looked forward to refund season because... Uh, the four children I have, you can take that off right now. I don't want people to look at that yet. No, take that off too. There you go. Don't want to ruin the joke before I get there. Uh, but for years, I looked forward to refund season because with four children, all who qualified as dependents, I could count on a pretty healthy refund come, you know, April or so. So I looked forward to it. But one by one, the boys got older. And if you remember, at age 17, uh, they are technically no longer um, uh, dependents. You no longer get the benefit of having uh, a dependent once they turn 17. And I have a question about that. Uh, who decided that a child was independent at age 17? Have they never had an 18-year-old? Do they know about college, car insurance? Have they ever seen an 18-year-old eat, for example? Okay, and another question, if a 17-year-old is independent, why do I have a 26-year-old living in my basement? (laughs) Now, I just want to say, the son that lives in our basement is in graduate school, he's working, we love having him there, he's a great kid, and all that. Uh, But anyway, I hadn't gotten a refund in, I don't know, four or five years or so at all. This year I filed my taxes as usual, put all the stuff together, and sent it to my tax guy, and got all the information back, and as I expected, no refund promised. In fact, I owed a little bit of money. So I completed the forms, wrote the check, sent it into the IRS. Then just last week, I found an envelope in the mail. I recognized it as being from the IRS, because I remember what those envelopes looked like, and I realized it was a check. Uh, Now, I wasn't expecting a refund, because I had actually owed some money. So I was confused, and I started thinking, well, maybe there was a mistake. Maybe my tax guy made a mistake. And there really is a reason. Then maybe I, th- I thought maybe, maybe the IRS has been making a mistake for years. <laughs> maybe there's interest compounding on their mistake. There could be thousands in there. So with trembling hands, I opened the envelope. And what I found, in fact, was a refund check from the IRS. Now you can put up that first picture. You may not be able to see that, so zoom in. What I got was a check from the United States Treasury for one dollar. One dollar. Really? I mean, the government must have spent $10,000 just to process that. If they would have told me, I would have said, just keep it. Put it to the national debt, something. Well, that check was unexpected in more ways than one. That leads us to our story today. We are, of course, in our, in our series on the book of Ruth. Actually, the third week And this beautiful little unexpected 
story is sort of like an oasis of hope in the middle of our Old Testament, a, a part of the Bible that is sometimes uncomfortably violent and uncomfortably um, uh, just strange and chaotic. But here's this beautiful little story, an unexpected love story tucked in the greater love story of the entire Bible. Actually, it's a pivotal moment. We don't see it quite yet, but it's a pivotal moment in the entire history of God bringing salvation to the world. It's going to tell us how he wants to redeem not only the whole world, but to redeem you and to redeem me. So what's happened so far? So far, uh, Chapter 1 begins, as you remember, with a famine in Israel. Now God had given his people the promised land, the place of his presence and blessing, but a man named Elimelech sees the famine and takes his wife Naomi and their two young sons and goes to a place called Moab. Now we know, you might remember, that Moab and the Moabites were a place and a people that were hostile toward the Israelites and strangers to the God of Israel. So Moab was not a great place to go, but they went there. And while in Moab things go from bad to worse, the sons of Mary Moabite women, uh, one of them named Ruth, and Elimelech dies, uh, both the sons die, and Naomi is devastated. And if you are a mother here today and you've lost a child, you can identify with Naomi's personal loss and devastation. But she, uh, then she hears God is at work back home and the famine has ended, so she decides to return to Israel. She encourages these two Moabite uh, daughters-in-law to stay in Moab. That's their people. They should stay there. That would be easier for them. And in chapter 1, verse 8, we read, Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. This is the first little hint we see in this book that God is up to something. It's the first mention of this beautiful Hebrew word translated kindness. The word is hesed. We're going to talk more about it today. But Ruth decides to go with Naomi, surprisingly. And this is another hint that God is up to something special in this young Moabite widow named Ruth. Then right at the end of chapter 1, we read that, And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. This is another hint that even then, even in the midst of their loss and devastation, God is up to something special, even when Naomi could not see it. The barley harvest was beginning. Then in chapter 2, uh, we see it begins with uh, the greatest hint yet. It says that uh, even, evidently Naomi has a, a family relative who is very wealthy, a man of means, a man of great character and reputation. His name is Boaz. Now in that culture, family was everything. And people would have been expected in a, in a situation like this where there had been tragedy or loss, the family was expected to extend care to the entire extended family. That was cultural, much more than we have today in our culture. So here's a question. If Naomi knew that her husband had this rich man of great character who would have felt obligated to care for her, why have we not heard for him about him in 10 years? A whole decade has gone by of loss and devastation, and not once have we heard Naomi mention this man Boaz until chapter 2. Well, either she doesn't know about him, which would be very unusual in a whole family tree the way the ancient culture worked. More likely, there's something that kept Naomi from reaching out to Boaz. Maybe fear. Maybe fear of rejection. And after all, it's been a long time. Maybe shame. In those days in that culture, for an Israelite family to leave the promised land, even in a time of famine, and go to Moab, a cursed place, and then come back would have been shameful. Maybe she was ashamed that they left in the first place. Or maybe she was just proud. She struggled with pride. Naomi was an affluent woman at one time with an affluent husband. Maybe she didn't want to come back begging for help from anyone. Now, we don't know for sure. The scriptures don't tell us. What I'm suggesting is those three things, fear, shame, and pride, still keep us from God's blessing today. So, and we also notice that when Ruth and Naomi are coming back, they've both lost everything, but they come back with different attitudes. Naomi is kind of resigned and defeated. Uh, she even says, don't call me Naomi any longer. Call me Mara because I'm bitter. Her heart was empty except for bitterness and pain. But Ruth, on the other hand, uh, is, is stirring with faith. She says to Naomi, no, I'll go where you go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. There's something stirring in this Moabite woman. 
And so Ruth decides to seek favor. She, she seeks someone who will allow her to glean in their field. Remember, God had commanded his people to, to leave the edges of the field unharvested so that the poor, so that the resident foreigner could have at least the scraps of their fields to eat. So Ruth winds up gleaning in the field of a man named Boaz. Boaz not only notices her, but he offers her the favor of both his provision and his protection. And she works all morning. And today we pick up the story right about lunchtime. So this is uh, Ruth chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here. Have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, uh, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to about an ephah. Now that's a measurement. We'll talk about that in just a minute. She carried it back to town and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Now the first thing we see in this part of chapter 2 is unexpected kindness. An unexpected kindness. Uh, one of my very favorite stories from my years here at Chapel Street, formerly FBCG, a senior pastor, happened somewhere around 2005 or so. We had uh, oh, just we had opened our, our what we called at that time our West Campus uh, about a year earlier. Church was growing. We were hiring staff and so forth. But we we're coming to the end of the fiscal year. For us, that's August 31st. And as often will happen, or used to happen in those days, our summertime giving uh, had had just had just slowed a bit, had dipped a bit, and so we were running just a bit behind on our projected budget. Um, wasn't a terribly large amount, but we thought it was enough to, to just make our church family aware. Uh, because we wanted to close the gap by the end of the fiscal year. And just a side note on generosity here, we just finished a leadership retreat this weekend, and eight of the last 11 months at Chapel Street have set records for giving for that month, eight of the last 11. So thank you for your generosity. God is doing something special uh, in our midst. But we were in this little bit of a, a, a slow time. I think at the time we published a deficit in the bulletin of about $100,000. Sounds like a lot, but we weren't that concerned because it, 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 our church family usually would make up that difference when we communicated it. Anyway, right in that time, about a week or so after we published it, I got a phone call from a person in the church, a man in the church, uh, who asked to make an appointment with me to talk about the church budget. Now, I knew this gentleman, uh, and uh, he sounded like he was more than concerned. Uh, he had the, uh, this was a, a guy who had the spiritual gift of, of, of being cantankerous. Um, you know someone like that. I mean, everything they say sounds sort of angry and upset. He just had that gift. I now know it wasn't the case. He just sounded like that. But he said he wanted to make an appointment to talk about the, the, the money issue. And so we made this appointment, and I fully expected him to show up and be very critical about our financial situation, our management, our decisions, and so forth. So he came in, and in his rather abrupt way, he said, I saw in the bulletin that we're behind in our budget. And so I sort of started to stammer through an explanation. Well, you know, it happens sometimes this time of year. We just want to make the church family aware, and he's really not. And he interrupted me. He said, how much are we behind? I said, well... Uh, last week it was about a hundred thousand, but this week is only about thirty thousand. He, without hesitation, pulled a checkbook out of his coat pocket, asked for a pen, and right on my desk wrote a check for thirty thousand dollars to the church. Handed it to him, and he said, "You should have had this appointment last week." <laughs> I did not see that coming. That gentleman, he passed away only a year or two after that little story, uh, but I never forgot the unexpected nature of that gift. Verse 14 says, At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come over here and have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. It sounds very normal to us, but this is a surprising, shocking thing. Boaz invites Ruth to eat with him at his table. Highly unusual in that culture. Almost scandalous. This would have been the tent or the shelter set aside for Boaz, who owned the whole property, all right, to have his meal. Maybe even allow some of his male uh, workers, maybe his foreman to come in and have his, share his table. But a woman who was just gleaning, picking up scraps, a Moabite woman, unheard of. 
but he invites her to come in, share the bread and the wine of his table. Remind you of anything? It should. Hold that thought. The second thing we see is when she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. Boaz offers her roasted grain. This was the food that had been prepared for him. He's the boss. And he is serving her his food. Highly unusual in that culture for a man to serve a woman, especially a foreign woman. Now he's already allowed her to glean in his field, which is what the law of God required, now he offers much more than was required. She ate all she wanted and had, notice, had some left over. Does that remind you of anything? Remember the story of the feeding of the 5,000 in the New Testament? Luke chapter 9, they all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The third thing we see is in verse 15. As she got up to glean, so she's starting again second half of the day, Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather among the sheaves. That's different than gleaning. Let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So now he orders his men, one can assume all Israelite men, he orders them to allow Ruth, a foreigner, to do more than glean, to gather among the sheaves, and then top it all off, he says, now give her some extra. Pull out some stalks and leave them there, drop them around so she can pick those up too. It's like Ruth is pushing her shopping cart through the, the grocery store, and Boaz just keeps throwing stuff in the cart. He's dumping stuff in the cart so she can take it home. And then he says, and don't rebuke her. Remember, he had already told his men not to touch her. That was last week. Because a, a, a single widow Moabite woman of her age was in danger in those days. He had already told them not to touch her. Now he says, don't speak harshly to her. Another form of protection. And then in verse 17, so Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah. Now what's an ephah? An ephah was a measurement of grain. Uh, scholars believe if you uh, converted it to our uh, measurements today, it would be about 30 pounds worth of grain. Now, the average man at that time would have consumed or needed about one or two pounds for a day or a week. I, I don't remember what the exact actual study was. But what would that look like? So I have here with me today, you may wonder, this is 30 pounds of pancake mix. After service, we're having a big pancake breakfast. <laughs> but 30 pounds of pancake mix. How long could my family, my wife and I, if it was just two of us, eat Pancake. We might get tired of pancakes, but we could eat for a couple of months on 30 pounds. I could feed everybody here, at least for a couple days, on 30 pounds of pancake mix. So that's a lot of food. Uh, the point here is that anyone in that culture would have immediately seen as she's, dra she's dragging home 30 pounds, probably in a big sack on her back, that Boaz had provided way, way more than was required or expected. Verse 18, so she carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Evidently, she took a, bag, a doggy bag home, too, from lunch. I want you to see the theme here. The theme here is abundant kindness. More than the law required, more than could possibly have been expected, and more than enough. This is the favor of God. This is what we call grace. This is what the Apostle Paul in the New Testament called the grace of Christ that he lavished on us. It's more than enough. Remember what Naomi had said back in the first chapter? She had said, I went away full, but the Lord brought me back empty. Naomi was empty, bitter, and hopeless, but even when she felt that way, God was up to something that she could not yet see. Now, I would expect that some of us here in the room today know what that's like, know what Moab is like, experience loss or brokenness. And I want you to know something, that this story tells us that God is still working even when we can't see what he might be doing. Ruth seeks favor. She winds up in the field of Boaz. Boaz notices her. Boaz provides for her. Boaz protects her and offers abundant kindness 
And I wonder what this reminds you of. I wonder who this reminds you of. Does it remind you of the one who offered living water to a Samaritan woman standing beside a well? Does it remind you of the one who offered grace to the woman accused of adultery, dragged before him in the dirt in shame? Does it remind you of the one who said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven, so pick up your mat and walk? You know, last week, Pastor Jeff, if you were here, said the reason we study a 3,000-year-old story, an ancient story in the Bible, is so that we can see in that story what God is like. And we can see clearly in that story what he does and what he's like. We can then see more clearly right here in our lives what he's like and what he does. So the first thing we see is unexpected kindness. The second thing we see here is unexpected hope. Unexpected hope. I wonder if anyone here in the room today happens to be related to anybody famous. For example, is anyone here uh, related anywhere in your family tree? to a United States president. Anybody? Oh, a couple people. Congratulations. Vice president? A governor? Of course, in Illinois, you might have to visit them and... Um. <laughs> How about a movie star? Anybody related to the movie star? Television star? Anybody been on Jeopardy? You know? <laughs> well, my grandmother on my mom's side uh, passed away when I was just 10 years old. And that's, as is the case with a lot of us, the first experience we have with, with death or a funeral is a grandparent. And that was true for me. So our whole family traveled down to Virgie, Kentucky, in the hills of eastern Kentucky where my mom grew up uh, for my grandmother's funeral. My first experience is I remember being a little more kind of intrigued uh, by the whole thing than I was sad, although I could see my, my mother's grief and the grief of others around. But before the funeral started, probably during the visiting time, little tiny mountain church, uh, or maybe just a funeral home. We're sitting there, and I was sitting there just watching everybody. Um, and my Uncle Butch, my mom's youngest brother, was sitting next to me. And Uncle Butch uh, had kind of a mischievous side to him, and he knew that even at age 10, I, I loved baseball. Uh, and then he leaned over to me, and he said, this is at his own mother's funeral. He leaned over to me, and he said, hey, did you know that our family is related to Casey Stengel? Now, some of you recognize who Casey Stengel is, right? At, at age 10, I already knew who he was. He was the famous as the manager of the New York Yankees. I eventually managed the Mets, is in the Baseball Hall of Fame. And I knew a lot about Casey Stengel. He said, did you know we're related to him? I said, no. He said, well, look up there at the front of the room. Look up there. And I looked up there, and there was this old man, craggy face. And if I imagined just right, you know, in a baseball uniform, he said, that, that's, that's your uncle Casey. He's your great, he's your uncle. I said, Casey Stengel? He said, yeah, Casey Stengel. Is our, are you related to him? And I'm looking, I started to imagine, what, 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 what if we are? I started to get the hope that, that I could t- uh, he could tell stories, sit around and tell stories about Mickey Mantle and Babe Ruth. He'd be, I mean, all my heroes. I could go home to my friends and say, Look, guess, guess who I'm related to, right? And just as I got up the courage, he was going, go, ahead, go up, talk to him. Go up, you can talk to him. And I was just getting out of the pew, and he grabbed me and said, nah, nah, I'm just kidding. That's just your great uncle Plez. Yeah. <laughs> and just like that, my hopes of fame were gone. Verse 19, look, her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I work with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. I'm going to explain that phrase in a minute. Verse 21, then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him because in someone else's field you might be harmed. The Hebrew word there is molested. It was dangerous to be a woman in those days. Verse 23, so Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvest were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Now I want you to see, this is the center of this chapter 2 in Ruth. This, in fact, is the center of the entire book of Ruth, the whole story. In fact, it's a watershed moment in the entire salvation history of the Bible. We're going to see that in a couple of weeks, but I want to mention it here, because here we are introduced to the concept, the idea of a guardian redeemer. 
Your Bible might say kinsman redeemer or just redeemer. It makes us ask three questions. First, who is, is Naomi talking about? Ruth has brought back this big pile of grain, 30 pounds of it, and more in a doggy bag. And so Naomi's going, who gave you so much food? That's enough for months. Ruth says his name is Boaz. Then Naomi says, verse 20, the Lord bless him. He said to her daughter-in-law, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, he, let me pause there, who is the he she's talking about? If you read it, she says, the Lord bless him. Is the he the Lord or is the he the him? Boaz. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. It's possible she's talking about either, grammatically speaking. And the best way to understand it is that she is talking about both. Because the Lord is showing his kindness through Boaz. It's just how God works. Second, what is he like? What's his character? He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. That's that word hesed again. Now hesed is one of the great words of the entire Old Testament. Uh, it, it describes most often the character of God himself. For example, Isaiah 54. For the mountains may depart and the heel, uh, hills may be removed, but my hesed, my steadfast love, shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Now, hesed is most often translated as steadfast love or maybe loving kindness but it's more even than that. We almost can't capture it in our language. Let's say today you go to leave church and you're, back, you're, you're leaving the parking lot and somebody else is trying to get out at the same time as you and you pause, you wave them, and they get to go in front of you. That's kindness, but it's not hesed. Here's hesed. Let's say you're in the parking lot today. You're going to, to leave and someone backs their car out and backs right into your car and dents the side of your car. Okay, hesed is not asking for their insurance. Hesed is saying, I got it, paying for the dent yourself. Oh, and more than that, asking how much they still owe on their car, paying the rest of their car payments, and then buying a car for every one of their children and their grandchildren. That's hesed. You see what I'm talking about? More than expected, more than required, absolutely independent of the other person's behavior or situation. Hesed. This is what Naomi prayed for back in chapter 1, that her daughters-in-law would know. But she wasn't praying it for herself. Now we see that prayer is being answered. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Now what's a guardian redeemer? We don't have anything like this in our culture. The Hebrew word is often translated kinsman redeemer, and it's a person in the ancient culture, ancient Jewish culture, who had to meet these criteria. Had to be a male blood relative, had to be a male blood relative who had enough resources to redeem a whole family, to buy back their property and to provide for all of them, and had to be willing to marry the widow of the one who had died so that his family line would continue. That's critical in this story. Boaz is a guardian redeemer for Naomi and therefore for Ruth because Ruth is now related to Naomi. I want to pause here for a moment. I was talking uh, this week with uh, our new pastoral resident, a young man named Joe Scavato. You'll get to know him through the summer. Uh, he preached last night at Mill Creek Campus. Um, we were talking about this passage, and Joe asked an interesting question. He said, what if the story just ended here? Ended with full bellies, 30 pounds of pancake mix. Uh, Ruth has a job. She can go glean as long as the harvest is going on. They've landed on their feet, right? What if it just ended here? And what he's saying was many of us kind of let the story end here. That's what we pray for. We pray for satisfied lives. We pray for physical needs. We pray for have a roof over our heads. And if we get those things, we're good. But he said the story is not about that. This is not where the story ends. The story isn't about 30 pounds of pancake mix. God is up to something much bigger and much better. Let me try to explain. When I was about 25 years old, I was single, um, and I believed God had called me to ministry. I just didn't quite know how to get there, and I've told parts of this story at different times. I had two college degrees. I had a master's degree. 
um, but I still felt far from where I needed to be. So after a lot of prayer and consideration, talking to mentors, I decided to apply for a program at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. They had a combined program, PhD in psychology, Master of Divinity. It was right down my alley what I was interested in. I knew they only took nine students a year out of the hundreds that applied, but I really felt God led me toward that through a whole series of things to apply. And so I fully expected to get in. I even let go of my, uh, a lease on a place I was li living. I let go of part of the, one of the jobs I had. I was so convinced I was going to California for the next four years or so. Well, about three weeks later, after I applied, I got this little thin envelope in the mail. And if you remember the days when you're applying to school, when you get a fat envelope, you've been accepted. There's a lot of information in there. If you get rejected, you get a thin envelope. I opened it up, and it was a le I got rejected. I didn't get in. And I was shocked. I was also disappointed, and I was angry. I felt like God had sort of pulled the rug right out from underneath me. Like, how, how, what? How could you? What I didn't know is that he was up to something that I couldn't see yet. And here's what happened. About two months later, resigned to staying around one more year at what I was doing, I met the woman who had become my wife. And what I learned was God was working for something better, more than I could imagine, even when I couldn't see it. So I wonder where you are in your story today. Have you been to Moab? Now, Moab for us is a spiritual place. It's not a, not a physical place. It's a spiritual place. It's a place that looks good, but, but when we get there, it's not good. It's a place that takes us away from God's blessing and God's presence. Have you drifted away have you suffered loss or pain? Have you been afraid and too ashamed to ask for help, especially to ask for his favor? Have you felt that God has forgotten you in some way? Now, this part of the story of Ruth reminds us of what God is like. And what he is like is hesed. Steadfast love, abundant, unending kindness and grace. More than you could expect, more than you deserve, more than you can imagine. That's what he's like. This part of the story of Ruth reminds us what God does. He redeems. He has the resources. He offers a blood relative. And he offers that blood to buy back. To buy back everything about us. Our entire lives, our entire eternity, all bought and purchased by a price that he paid. Because... You have a Redeemer. We have a Redeemer. And that's where the story is going. Would you bow with me as I close today? Lord, we thank you for this ancient story. It's a beautiful story. It's a surprising story. It's a strange little story. But in this story, you reveal so much about your character, who you are, your loving kindness, your grace, more than we could expect, more than we deserve, more than we need, everything we need. Thank you for being the God who redeems, buys back. One who is working for something bigger, something better, even when we can't yet see what you're doing. Help us to know and trust you as our Redeemer. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.